Jingiwala. Uh, we are coming to you today from the Kulin Nations, uh, the land of the Woiwurrung Wurundjeri peoples. Um, we would like to, before we begin any of our conversation tonight, our incredibly exciting conversation uh, between a legendary poet, uh, Mark Nowak, and also amazing legendary poet, Benjamin Laird, um, we would like to pay our respects and our honour to the Kula Nations for their ongoing custodianship of this country, for their care for this place and for the sovereignty that has never been ceded over this land. Uh, in light of that continued sovereignty, we also take this opportunity to remind ourselves to continue to be respectful and to continue to honour the Kulin, uh, to honour their care, to honour their legacy and to honour the futurity of um, their custodianship of their country. We would also like to extend our respect and our acknowledgements to um, the Mohegan Nation uh, from which um, uh, from which Mark is broadcasting to us today and uh, Benjamin and Godfrey are also on the Kulin Nation today. Uh, so um, we are speaking to you in our capacity as Overland Literary Journal uh, to facilitate this event. Um, of which we're the editors, this is Evelyn Harrell Lewin and I'm Jonathan Dunk. Welcome to another wonderful Overland online event. Um, in a second, we're going to have the director of the United Workers Union, Godfrey Moss, come and talk about um, Mark's wonderful work, both as a poet uh, and a Marxist thinker. Um, just briefly, that was a moment of, institu moment of institutional pride. Um, Benjamin Laird, uh, our own website producer, is a Melbourne-based computer programmer and a poet. He is currently a PhD candidate at RMIT. Uh, in programming, and uh, he also works for Cordite Poetry Review as well as us. Uh, in this event, you'll be able to ask some questions that I'll be collating to direct to Benjamin and to Mark at the end. So please feel free to comment on our YouTube, to comment on Facebook, uh, to provide any questions, thoughts you might uh, you might like discussed, and we will make sure that those are passed along. This conversation is going to go until about. 10 to uh, 10 to 9 and we'll and that's be in total I think in Mark total. and Ben will speak for about half an hour and then there will be responses yeah yeah responses to any questions so big thank you to Benjamin and to Mark and we will now pass over to Godfrey thank you very much Evelyn um, so my name's Godfrey, I'm an executive director with the United Workers' Union uh, and United Workers' Union represents about 150,000 workers around the country, all doing very essential and necessary work in a range of industries and the way we like to frame it is doing care work from cradle to grave uh, and producing the food we need from farm to table. United Workers' Union has a long-standing and proud relationship with Overland Literary Journal and we think it's really important that we support the creative endeavours because workers are not just widgets, workers are fully formed human beings who have voices and see creative expression and this is a really important partnership for us. And so it's really great that we can be helping to support this event tonight with Mark Nowak. Uh, Mark Nowak is the author of Coal Mountain Elementary, Shut Up, Shut Down and Revenants. He is the recipient of the Freedom Plough Award for Poetry and Activism and fellowships from the Lennon and Guggenheim Foundations. Nowak has led poetry workshops for workers and trade unions in the US, South Africa, the UK, Panama, the Netherlands and elsewhere. He's currently a professor of English at Manhattanville College and the founding director of the Worker Writers School. Mark's latest book, Social Poetics, documents the imaginative militancy and emergent solidarities of a new insurgent working class poetry community rising up across the globe. Part autobiography, part literary criticism, part Marxist theory, Social Poetics presents a people's history of the poetry workshop from the founding director of the Worker Writers School. Noak illustrates not just what poetry means, but what it does to and for people outside traditionally traditional literary spaces, from taxi drivers to street vendors and other workers of the world who are uniting. So over to you, Mark and Benjamin. Cool. 
Hi, Martin. Welcome. Uh, that was a, um, a great introduction by Godfrey, where I guess you um, got to talk about the, the union that is involved with as well that's sponsoring this um, event. Uh, and it's so, um, I guess it's so central to your, um, I'll hold it up, amazing uh, book that we're talking about today, um, Social Poetics, um, this relationship uh, between uh, workers and, uh, I guess, creativity and poetry. Uh, but I wanted to start with the the title of the, the book, Social Poetics, um, because it's so central to everything that runs through each of the chapters, and you give a really nice um, description of that uh, at the beginning. So uh, Social Poetics is both your practice and also, I guess, what comes out of this book. Do you want to talk about what that means to you a bit more? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you to Overland and uh, United Workers Union for for sponsoring this. It's it's great to talk with uh, you and with everybody. Um, you know, social poetics is my uh, attempt to look at the role of the poetry workshop in the social sphere uh, outside of the institutions. The poetry here in the United States, at least, is usually taught in colleges and MFA and graduate creative writing programs. Uh, so it looks kind of begins with a historical look at the poetry workshop uh, in communities, particularly in times of uprising and rebellion. So the early chapters look at uh, the poetry workshops that came on the heels of the Watts uprising in Los Angeles, uh, June Jordan's poetry workshops uh, during the New York City teacher strike with young people. Um, trade union workshop in South Africa, uh, anti-apartheid trade union workshop, um, workshops right after the Attica prison uprising, and tries to really um, look at the poetry produced in those as as the writing of both kind of poets and, and people's historians, to borrow the language of E.P. Thompson and Howard Zinn. And, and what does it mean for working people in a trade union in South Africa or a fifth grader in Brooklyn to think poetically about what's happening in their lives and to try to document that uh, on the page. Um, yeah, so the part of that documentation, I guess, is both, and I guess this is part of your documentation as well, in, on the one hand that um, I think you, you have copies of the, the anthologies that you discuss in the first, mm -hmm. um, the first couple of chapters. Um, and I guess part of that is the the poets themselves being um, historians of their own and the workers being historians of their own histories. And also you coming in here as perhaps in some ways a, a, an extension of your documentary poetics practice, documenting these as well. So like remembering these these memories that have been uh, bound up. I know in, um, in early on in the book, you talk about the fact that we've had 50 years of writers workshops, but um, very little of it has been captured. Uh, were there any that you perhaps wanted to include in social poetics that you didn't have enough room for, or is this a <laughs> is this a practice that? Yeah, well, you know, it's uh, there certainly was. I, I think I cut maybe fifteen thousand words out of the book because you know it's already a three hundred page book, and so there were yeah. workshops that. Uh, you know, I think there's sort of a, a really large history of these kind of workshops happening and small anthologies coming out of them. But, you know, here in the United States, uh, these these poetry books are being removed from public libraries uh, and university libraries. You know, all the books I have here, I'll just like this one example. So this is an anthology called Betcha Ain't Poems from Attica. Uh, edited by uh, Celeste Tisdale, uh, a poet uh, in Buffalo, New York, who after the Attica prison uprising, uh, went to Attica and spent two years every Wednesday, he would go and do poetry workshops uh, at the prison uh, with those who had been involved in the uprising. And, you know, this beautiful book came out uh, 1974 from a very important press in the United States, Broadside Press, Dudley Randall's uh, very important uh, black press, black arts movement press out of Detroit. And, uh, you know, it went into print, it sold out, and then it never got reprinted. It's n it's almost, you can't find it here anymore. Uh, you know, on a, one of the online book selling sites, it might be a $500 book. And so I talk about it a little bit in social poetics, but um, 
I couldn't find the editor, uh, even though he's from the same hometown as mine, Buffalo, uh, because he had moved away uh, a few years ago and moved to the to the south. But I did eventually end up finding him and was talking to him about this book. And I said, you know, this is such incredible poetry and the 50th anniversary of the Attica uprising is going to be next summer, uh, next September. And um, we should talk about, like, can't we bring this book back into print, like find a publisher who would do that? And he said to me, you know, Mark, those aren't the only poems from the workshop. And I also kept a journal every week when I went in. And I said, Celeste, you know, <laughs> this is like a, we could do an expanded version of it. And uh, so I flew down to, uh, to Georgia to meet with him. And uh, we spent some time together. You know, all of this work was in his uh, closet, you know, sitting there and been sitting there for 45 years. And I'm happy to say that uh, the book is coming out uh, next summer. Uh, but it's just a testimony to the kind of, I think, creative work by, by people in the social sphere that is, is out there and, and not in published form. You know, it's in people's closets. It's in little chat books that have come out and went out of print and we don't read them and study them anymore. So really what I hope Social Poetics is, is just the beginning of this process to look at what other trade unions, what other you know, public schools or community spaces, did workshops happen and a small chapbook or anthology come out and was maybe only shared within the community. Let's look at those, let's study those, let's examine what poets in those anthologies, like how are they picturing the world at that point in history? Yeah, um, it really struck me when I was reading it as well, there was a, um, a series of workers um, Worker poetry journal from the late 70s and early 80s in Melbourne, um, and I have a I managed to get a collection when they were being offloaded by a library as well in a similar circumstances. And I found a uh, a poem written by a Ford worker in in there, and it made me think of um, the work that you did at the the audit with the auto workers in the US and and South Africa, and how there are connections there, but also tying to I guess your idea of consonants. Um, where we see these links as a, as a form of solidarity. Um, you talk about how like the, these, I guess these trans, transnational and international um, connections and the way that, that the workers in your workshops also responded to poetry of other workers. Sure. So, um, you know, as I started these workshops in Chicago with, um, with a uh, group of Teamsters uh, truck drivers and uh, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Union. Uh, and so I did those workshops, but I had been a uh, part of the National Writers Union here in the US and had been chair of the Political Issues Committee in Minnesota. And part of like what I took as my charge in that position was to, to form or, or reconnect with the United Auto Workers Union because the uh, National Writers Union was formed under the umbrella of the UAW uh, and of the auto workers. And so uh, I, you know, we started holding our meetings at their union hall. And then uh, a little while after that, Ford announced uh, its restructuring plan, which they called the way forward. And what the way forward meant for Ford and Ford workers was that Ford was gonna close 13 plants, uh, factories in Canada and the United States and uh, permanently uh, lay off something like 30,000 workers. Uh, and the plant in Minnesota, where I was living at the time, was one of those plants. So I said, you know, I had been doing this kind of poetry workshop with trade unions in Chicago, and might it be interested, they be interested in the workshop. So we started a workshop, and we had some of the workers come in between shifts and start writing about what it meant to work at a place for 30, 35 years. There's one poet whose poem is in the book, Denny Dickhausen, who not only had he worked there for 35 years, but his daughter had was currently working there as well. And he was like, what? what is my daughter going to do? You know, how is she going to find uh, a job now to pay her mortgage to send her kids to school when this job she's been working for, you know, since she was probably 20 years old is just being torn away. So I did those workshops for, uh, for a while. And then I got a grant to go to South Africa. Uh, it was a grant to uh, study at the National English Literary uh, Museum, uh, South African Worker Poetry, I wanted to look more closely at. And so I just, you know, I had in the United States this great idea where I would 
try to write to all the other forward plants that were closing in the US and Canada and do a similar kind of workshop. And then workers from all these different uh, Ford factories around the country could write about what it was like to have their jobs taken away. And unfortunately, I didn't hear back from any of those other uh, Ford plants, UAW unions. Um, but when so I wrote to the union in South Africa, NUMSA, the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, and just told them about what I was doing uh, in Minnesota. And maybe, you know, could I, I don't know, do a workshop or at least visit the plant and meet with the union. And they sent back, uh, unlike their uh, U.S. counterparts, sent back an email like two days later, which was like, we would like you to do eight hour a day poetry workshop at the uh, Ford engine plant in Port Elizabeth and the main factory in Pretoria. There'll be uh, eight hours a day. Here is the phone number of your driver who will pick you up at your guest house. Uh, are you a vegetarian? Because we're going to cater lunches. It was like this completely opposite response uh, that I had had uh, in the US. And of course, that was because in South Africa, there was a long tradition of trade unions and cultural workers working together. You know, another one of the anthologies I talk about in uh, the beginning of the book is this one called Black Mamba Rising, which is an anthology of uh, South African trade union workers uh, and the, the anti-apartheid poetry that they were writing. And this book, like if you read, uh, it's an incredible book. And as you read through it and you study the history of it, like these poets were reading in like, large football soccer stadiums like full of people that trade union rallies the workers from the union from the organization became kind of spokespeople through poetry about the living conditions at that time for for black workers in south africa and i th i feel like the same is true uh in some of this work that we're trying to do with the worker writer school you know we have our members now who read poems that there's a story about a taxi driver at a rally in New York City uh, outside City Hall trying to put a, a cap uh, on gig drivers, Uber and Lyft drivers, so that the yellow cab drivers could actually continue to make a living. There had been a long string of suicides among yellow taxi drivers in New York City at that time because there were so many cars on the street, nobody could make a living anymore. And, uh, and so one of the poets from our group uh, at one of their big rallies outside City Hall was asked by the, uh, by the Workers' Center, the New York Taxi Workers Alliance, could he come and read and perform his poems? Uh, and so uh, the driver, Seth Goldman, uh, went out and among speakers and one of the brothers of the drivers who had killed himself and others read this really empowering poem as part of the, the, uh, the rally. And in fact, the next day, New York City Hall passed that that cap on how many independent gig drivers could work on the streets of New York, uh, giving the taxi workers a chance to, to continue to make a living. Yeah, um, uh, it, it's quite interesting, and and you mentioned the also this um I guess this uh, the first person plural the the working um, which is the title of one of your chapters, and also um, a, a conversation you had with. Um, thought meters earlier about the, um, I guess about the politics of the, the plural we, and I know that you uh, that's been, but while recognizing um, each of the individual workers and and the poetry, uh, and you do these um, these collective poems, uh, so the the quite powerful um, collective poem towards the end of social poetics that you do with the workers writers um, that was um, shown up as a projection. Uh, mm -hmm where it was just orders that people were given throughout the day. Um, that, that was a, yeah, it's quite a, quite a powerful poem in itself. Um, are there many, um, do people, do, do the people in the workshops quite enjoy the, those collective, writing those collective poems? Is it a form of, um, you know, opposed to, as opposed to, I suppose, I guess, more um, writing by themselves? Or is it, it's a part oh. of a, yeah, so one of the things I really try to, um, the kind of frameworks of social poetics is that to, to talk about this space between the first person singular, the I, and the first person plural, the we, right? And so the first person singular, the I, uh, is, is thinking through self-determination, like 
what does it mean to be who I am and my place in history in relationship to, to others? And here is my story and here is my poem. And I think it's incredibly important to create a space within these workshops to uh, for workers to write those those first person singular poems because we don't hear workers' voices. You know, the, the groups who are part of our workshop, the Street Vendor Project, Domestic Workers United, uh, the New York Taxi Workers Alliance and others, like, we don't hear their stories in the news, on the radio, uh, on television, on Netflix, right? Like the worker stories aren't out there. And so one of the things we're trying to do is create a platform for that. But simultaneously, one of the things we really try to focus on in the worker writer school is also writing in the first person plural, right? Writing in the we voice. And so I spend a lot of time looking for um, kind of historic or contemporary poetic forms where we can write together, where we can all tell part of our own story, because that is part that we voice is, is our collective action. It's how we build solidarity. It's how we see that my story and your story and your story are interrelated. So, you know, I, if you don't mind, I'm just going to read the beginning of that poem that you mentioned. Because <laughs> there's, there's this poem called Worker Instruction Manual, which you mentioned that what I asked is that just everyone copied down an order that they were given at work and that time at which they were given it. And so what we really end up finding out in the poem is that the worker's day is not, you know, from nine to five or whatever your shift happens to be, but is instead the 24 hour workday, right? That some workers, members of the Street Mender Project are starting out at, you know, what is here, you know, before six o'clock in the morning, right? And they work through the, through the day. You hear taxi drivers starting to pick people up to take them to the airports. You hear dom domestic workers starting to take care of uh, children and get them ready to school. And it goes through the whole day until sometimes one, two, three o'clock in the morning, people are still given, uh, um, orders at work. And so we, we kind of try to document the 24 hour clock of the work day. And so these are just the first couple of entries so you can get a sense of, of what this poem sounds like. 5 a.m. Check the hot tank to make sure it is working. 6 a.m. Take me to 70th and Central Park West. Please go slowly. I'm pregnant. 6.01 a.m. Do you have today's menu on the side window? 6.59 a.m. Did you put your badge, your ID badge around your neck to avoid getting a ticket? 7 a.m. Fill up the water in the hot tanks? 7.15 a.m. I'm going to LaGuardia. Can you open the door for me? I'm coffee impaired. And so it goes on like that all the way until 10, uh, till two o'clock in the morning. So it ends on these two lines. 1.35 a.m. Give her one more ounce. 2.44 a.m. Do not let her sleep on her tummy. Right? And then it goes right back to 5 a.m. And the, and the start of the workday. And so it's a, it's a poem that we've, uh, we've used a lot. We've read it. We've performed it. Uh, but we also have a projection of it. So sometimes when we do an event, it'll just be on the wall of the space. And as people come in, they'll just see it on, on, a, on a loop. So that wherever you enter, you might enter at noon and start hearing workers' orders. And then as you sit down in your seat, it becomes 7 p.m., it becomes 2 a.m., it becomes 5 a.m. And if, what the sense that you get is, is that the workers' day is never complete. Um, and it's really interesting in the, in the book how you um, contrast it with, I guess, uh, similar conceptual poetry projects that are kind of divorced from uh, people's lives and sit within a purely aesthetic um, realm. And uh, you talk, and I guess this is also um, something that uh, creative people that are interested in um, political action and political activism and are involved in both um, struggle with too, is the, the balance between the aesthetics or the poetry and the politics and not subordinating one to the other. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's encompassed a lot of your practice um, over the years, including with um, the Union of Radical uh, Workers and Writers. I think that's the order, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so can you talk a, a bit about about that, about the balance between the, the yeah. aesthetic and the political? Yeah, so one interesting thing, and I saw uh, in the comments that one of our members, Keely, 
uh, is uh, is here as well. So uh, I'll talk about her writing a little bit as well. Uh, so we started um, last September to look at the the poetry form of the haiku, which you know, a three line poem, five seven five syllable count. Lots of people, maybe most people, have written one at some point in you know I don't know early school or high school or. Um, but we really take a look in the work of writing school at the kind of more radical history of the form. So we studied, um, you know, our, our year started out last September uh, with a, a, a very well-known um, Japanese translator uh, and uh, literary critic, uh, Hiroaki Sato. He had a book come out called An Haiku from New Directions Press in the United States. Uh, and so he came to a, a, a big forum we held uh, in September, along with, uh, you know, kind of radical educators and prison abolitionists. Bill Ayer spoke at it, uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore spoke at it, and others. And so Hir Hiroaki um, gave a workshop on the haiku and the traditional form and how he translates them. Um, and so we started studying classical Japanese haiku, uh, basho, isa, busan, uh, and others. But then we started looking at this, the how the haiku had been used in different kind of more political frameworks in the United States. So we looked at um, the Japanese American internment uh, camp haiku from World War II. We looked at the haiku from the Attica prison anthology that I held up a second ago. We looked at uh, black arts movement poets like Sonia Sanchez and her use of haiku. Amiri Baraka uh, wrote this form called a loku, uh, a C-O-U-P, like a low revolution, a revolution from below. Uh, and workers started, we've been writing haiku for several months when uh, COVID hit. Um, and so we were, we always meet the first Saturday of the month uh, at PEN America. Uh, and so I remember that day because, you know, we, this is now the start of our 10th year of the Worker Writers School in New York. And um, so a lot of us have been together for a long time. We're, we're kind of almost like a large family who gets together on Saturdays and has a big table of food and talks about and writes poetry. But on that first Saturday in March, uh, I remember that when people came in, instead of uh, hugging each other, I had a big pump of hand sanitizer because it was like co the news of COVID-19 was just starting to be, you would hear it in the news and people were starting to get like, what's going to happen? You know, are we going to have to, you know, nobody knew what was going to happen and nobody could have imagined what was going to happen. You know, over 200,000 deaths currently in the United States. Um, so as I was going to the workshop that day, I realized uh, that the word coronavirus had five syllables and it itself took up an entire line of a haiku. Uh, and so uh, when I got to workshop and we got in the room around the table and sat down and started talking, I asked everyone in the workshop, well, what about writing a coronavirus haiku where either the first or the last line of the haiku is the word coronavirus? How is coronavirus starting to affect your lives? So we did that workshop that day. We said our goodbyes. And within a week, New York City was shut down, right? And we all know what happened with coronavirus uh, in New York. And so a month later, it's the first Saturday of April, and we couldn't get together physically. But I sent out an email to everyone and said, do you want to get together on Zoom? And so we started meeting on Zoom, and, and everybody enjoyed it so much, we started meeting twice a month on Zoom. Uh, Keely, one of our members who was here on the on the chat, uh, wrote some incredible uh, haiku about she um, worked in one of the booths for the subway, the MTA, and about just what a day was like to be a frontline worker, what we call the central workers here, um, during coronavirus, what it meant to have to go to work and to see how people interacted with each other and to document that. We had members who are taxi drivers or uh, domestic workers, elder care workers. What did it mean to continue to drive a taxi in New York City during coronavirus? So we had produced these kind of political works. You know, some of the work, there was like a, a, a news story in the Albany, New York newspaper on the front page about work, our workers' uh, coronavirus haiku. Like, what, what does it really mean that that workers who are still working, how do they document that in poetry? But in terms of your question, we had studied the long tradition of haiku. We knew the Japanese masters. We knew the the uh, the internment camp haiku, the Attica haiku, Amiri Baraka, Sonia Sanchez. So one of the things about creating workshops like this that 
aren't like a weekend and then they end, but that continue for a long time. Like I said, we're starting our 10th year, is that you can really study various poetic forms as any other uh, writer would, right? Well-published, prize-winning writer. We study those forms. We look at them very closely. We work from them and write our own stories. So we're kind of trying in that way to we balance the craft and the politics, right? We write these poems, incredible haiku. We've been publishing on our Instagram page, uh, Worker Writer School, if people want to go and take a look. Uh, we have published uh, dozens of those, right? And so. Um, they've been published in magazines and journals and newspapers. And so that's a way in which we feel like we're trying to, to do kind of political analysis, literary production, um, build solidarity through all writing this poetic form together, like all of that working at one time. I suppose that unearths a lot of the, um, the, the histories as well of, of the different forms and of those political traditions that, that, that run in parallel. Um, I know you're, you're critical, you say in a number of points that, um, and I, I think it's, it's really captured by, I guess, what you're saying about the repeat, that these are these ongoing workshops. Um, but the idea of um, sometimes workshops that uh, run in, in prisons or are run with, um, Unions sometimes they're, they're just to give workers a voice, not as a, a political activity and that they're one off kind of actions as opposed to an ongoing process. So is that, yeah, I, I guess my question is, um, how do you find the balance between these workshops? Um, they're important um, to, I guess, uh, giving people voices and taking action and um, and ones that, I guess, end? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And I think that, you know, um, there's a great quote that I use in the book, which I can't remember exactly from Iron Dottie Roy, but it's basically there, you know, a lot of uh, times when these workshops run, um, the kind of tagline is we're giving voice to the voiceless, right? And, and Aaron Dotty Roy says that nobody is voiceless. There's just people are repressed from speaking, right? People are not given a space to do that. And so one of the things I think is really important about the sort of our practice of continuing to do this the first Saturday of every month, right? All year long, like doing these workshops is that I think about like here where I am in New York and going into the grocery store, right? And seeing the cashier behind the plastic shield, right? And working her or his long work day behind that shield. And certainly there are, are everyone behind the shield is, is thinking things, right? Is noticing things, is maybe thinking about home, is nervous about protecting their health and their safety and their family, is thinking like, how could this person be buying, you know, 12 pot, uh, containers of ice cream, like what's the reason for that? Like all of that stuff's happening. And maybe there are some of those workers who when they get home, they think about it more. Or they tell that story to a family member or a friend, or they text message somebody about it, right? Or hop on Zoom or FaceTime and have a comment, like you can't believe what happened at work today, right? Uh, and maybe there's even a few of those people who like keep a diary or a notebook or a journal and write that stuff down. You, we had talked about the Ford plant workshops and one of the people in the workshops, Danny Dickhausen, he always kept in his shirt pocket a little notebook and would just like write stuff down about what happened at work and put, you know, when the notebook got filled, he put it like in a shoebox in his basement. Uh, but he worked there for 30 years. He had all these notebooks and he never knew what to do with them. So the, the workshop became a place for him and has become a place for others to come and say, how do we take those things we think those things we see, what we imagine, and put it down on paper and bring a kind of writing craft to it and share it with others, right? And maybe in our case, perform it on a stage at a big literary festival or out in the streets at a demonstration, right? And so we're trying to, but we need to know it's always there, right? Because if that worker who I started with at the, who's the cashier at the grocery store, where does she or he have to go to, to write these stories. There's no workshops available for them. There's no there's no, no space for them. But if they find out about a workshop and it happened, it ended last week, 
that doesn't do them any good. But if they know, oh, well, next month on the first Saturday, I can come and write my story. If I go and write, I'll meet another worker at a restaurant or a retail worker from the Retail Action Project, one of our collaborators. And I'll meet taxi drivers and domestic workers and street vendors and, and other people who have stories similar to me, right? And I'm not alone behind that plastic shield thinking those things myself. I can be part of a writing community that tells our stories, that shares them at public events, that gets them published in newspapers and magazines. That can be me. And I think that's, that's a great possibility and potential for individual workers, but also for unions. You know, I think that one of the things we've seen with the Worker Writer School workshop is that it's also really useful for trade unions and worker centers because they have members producing stories that they can use in their social media, that they can use in their publications. They can have a YouTube video of one of their members reading about their, reading a story about their work experience. You know, we need that in the trade union movement, right? We we want something beyond like a pie chart and graph and and other kind of quantitative information, right? The people's stories are are a vital part and have been and continue to be a vital part of, of organizing workers. And so we believe that the creative writing workshop is a great space to try to do that. And even like us, once a month, but every month we're going to be there for you to write. And, you know, I even found you, you, you have a lot of um, poems from both your workshop and a lot of the anthologies within social poetics that you, you um, read and discuss. Um, and I guess uh, as essential to your book in terms of solidarity, there is a, a certain solidarity in reading poetry um, that other workers have written, have written so that these anthologies uh, can capture that moment and also help to I guess, inspire um, new writing uh, and um, some of your, and I, I see in some of your workshops that you take the writing from other workshops and, and you read it and you use them as um, starting points for, for other workers. Yeah, and there's a, a great anthology that came out a couple of years ago uh, called Iron Moon, a Chinese worker uh, poetry anthology. And it's, you know, a, I think 200 or more page anthology of poems by workers in China who have been getting together, meeting with each other, writing poems, sometimes publishing them in different uh, publications. Um, you know, although a, a lot of them are kind of battling censorship, et cetera. Um, but they're getting them out and this book collects them together. So we used, uh, and there's an example of it toward the end of the book where we uh, look at one of the worker poems from China called Language. Uh, we read it, we talk about it in the workshop. And then one of our members, uh, Alando McIntyre, uh, who is now a public school teacher, but had worked for when he was with us, you know, except for the past few years since he's gotten his degree in that job, he worked for 11 years at a Jamaican fast food restaurant in Brooklyn. And so he writes a poem modeled on that other worker poem called Language about his work uh, in that fast food restaurant. What does it mean to be there eight or 10 hours a day, you know, putting uh, Jamaican beef patties in a bag and handing them to customers, right? Like, how do you make a creative cultural work out of that that very repetitive job in the food industry? But- That is an amazing poem. It's an amazing it's a, poem. It's a terrific poem. Yeah. And, uh, but, but it's inspired by another worker poem, right? So we're inspired by classical Japanese haiku. We're inspired by Amiri Baraka. We read uh, contemporary poets like Natalie Diaz and Patricia Smith, and we've actually had them both present uh, at, our, at our workshops and at events. Uh, but we're also looking at the tradition of worker writers, right? Of the South African poets, of the Chinese poets that I just mentioned. So we're looking at that wide tradition of writing and and trying to get inspiration from that. Um, should we look at some of these questions on the? Uh, so there's a question. Uh, can you comment on the relationship between the 24-hour workday and hyper surveillance, the workers' life that you document, the absence of privacy, humanness outside of the application of labour? That poem you read rendered such a stark image, and I wonder how you see the poetic gaze reacting against the corporate gaze. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, certainly that poem, as, as you continue to read it, and it's like four pages long, right, uh, of the worker orders. Is, we, we had a long conversation about that, right, uh, in the workshop. And there's a, actually an article came out um, in the New Yorker about that particular workshop. A journalist came and sat in with us as we were discussing the workers' instruction manual. And he documents in that article that conversation that we had about what does it mean to get an order, right? Like, and from your boss. And so, you know, people were saying, well, that doesn't sound like an order. That just sounds like him saying, you know, like to do something, right? But a lot of people in the workshop then said, well, everything is an order that comes from your boss, right? And we noticed when we finished the poem that there wasn't one comment like, you know, like take a break, go home early, I hope you sleep well, nothing like that that was about, um, you know, what we call social reproduction, right? Like how does the worker reproduce themselves to go back to work another day? It was always just about the job, right? So even those orders themselves are a kind of surveillance, right? It's like not allowing the worker to move off a very narrow track of what they're supposed to do that day. There's no room for imagination. There's no room for creativity. There's no room to not follow the rules. They just must be followed. And so that itself is a kind of enclosure, a kind of containment, because workers don't have a voice individually or collectively in the workplace. And so I think that's one of the ways in which the creative writing workshop and the trade union workshop can work together, right? And in our lives that are, are so much under surveillance, are so much under watch, are so much like our, our times are being clocked and monitored more closely than ever, we then need an outlet, a space to, to respond to that, right? And I think that the creative work, writing workshop is one of those spaces. It also is a space to allow us to see beyond our own particular circumstances. Like I might feel that way at work. Like I am so under the rules, I am being watched, I am being ordered around, right? And then I see, I don't know, some worker on the Netflix show I'm watching at night, they don't seem to be that way. But I get to the workshop and then I talk to another worker and another worker and we're all living under those similar conditions. And so how can we document those in a poem? How can we write about those? And, you know, I talk about um, Ranciere's uh, research, right? And that workers are not looking to only document work, but to dream about spaces beyond that, right? And so this is where the workshop comes in as well. It's like, these, this might be where we're at in our working lives now, but what do we want them to be? What do we dream they can be? What do we hope that they can be uh, in a different kind of way? And then how, together with our worker centers and trained unions, can we make that happen? Uh, and there's a, another question. Imagine there's a lot of good answers to this, but where do you see the difference between your project and emotionally progressive, but the often apolitical history of avant-garde writing? No, oh, sure. Thank you for the question, Jonathan. Uh, hello to you too. Um, you know, I think uh, there's a there's a, a couple of things that are parallels. I know that one of the things that really differs from the Worker Writer School from other kind of writing workshops out there is that we're not sort of just an open workshop for any worker to come into. We are particularly doing collaborations with worker centers, uh, either in New York City or when I travel and do them elsewhere, you know, with the Indonesian Migrant Workers Union in Amsterdam and The Hague, for example, right? Um, it's really important for us not to just be like, we're having a workshop for workers and say you're a worker, maybe you're a, um, taking care of someone's elderly parent, right? And you come into our workshop and you write a poem about um, how difficult your job is and you're at the house 24 hours a day, but you're only being paid wages for 10 of those hours, right? And be, the, your employer saying, well, you're sleeping and you know, doing your own thing the other hours that you're there watching television. So you don't get paid for those hours, right? In a typical creative writing workshop, either a you know, more progressive or avant-garde institutional writing workshop or a, you know, another maybe even kind of community workshop, the only thing that can be produced when someone tells that story is empathy, right? And to us, the production of solely 
solely the production of empathy is part of the history of liberalism and neoliberalism, right? The only response can be, oh, that's terrible, right? Or I don't know, let's start a fundraiser for that person and make donations, right? Like that's the kind of response that typically happens. And we wanna be a space where we can say, oh, well, you're a live-in worker with someone's elderly parent and your, uh, your workplace rights are being denied to you, right? And here is the lead organizer of Domestic Workers United who passed the first uh, law in the United States, a bill of rights for domestic workers. And here are your actual rights. And here is a connection to other workers who can help you and talk you through this. And here are the legal uh, possibilities that you have to address your situation. And maybe here is a pro bono lawyer on our staff who can who can work with you under uh, about this situation, right? So we have in the workshop, because we're collaborating with worker centers, we have a way to kind of politically address that situation. It's not just like, this is this is bad, I'm so sorry, it's a beautiful poem, oh, change the line break in the second stanza, right? We want to go beyond that in a kind of a social poetics workshop. We want to say, we are building solidarity, we have connections to organizers and unions and institutions that can that can work to change what's happening to you as a worker in the workplace. And so that's that's super important for us that that there's this outcome from it that isn't solely the production of a poem, be it a lyric poem or an experimental poem. We want that, but we want the other thing too. And we believe that both of those can happen in the workshop. Um, and is that the, uh, I mean, I, I know that uh, an earlier point where you do talk about those traditional workshops within the university um, and you acknowledge the fact that it, it often leads to student debt and these incredibly underpaid, um, you know, uh, lecturers or casual workers. I mean, particularly in Australia at the moment, um, even before COVID, the precarity in the university sector was at an all time high and it's just been completely devastated by um, the pandemic. Uh, is there some way to rescue um, those models of of writing workshops, or do you think that the institution neoliberalism has done too much, too much damage? Yeah, you know, it's a uh, what you say is absolutely true, and uh, and I can't help but think that COVID is really going to bring about a kind of you know what Naomi Klein calls the shock doctrine. Right, we're going to see that in the in the university. Uh, and so for those of us who work in it, I think it's incredibly important to stay at the forefront of those battles. Uh, we've been doing uh, here a lot of organizing around uh, uh, adjuncts and wages and working conditions. But I think for the workshop itself, which you asked about, I'm really inspired by um, by the by the long history and teaching of Paulo Freire, right? And when Paulo Freire talks about schools and school communities, he doesn't just mean, you know, school administrators, school teachers, parents and children, right? He always talks about, and I mentioned this a little bit in the book, he's always talking about the janitor, the cleaning service people, the uh, security guards, the cafeteria workers. And that always makes me think about our creative writing workshops within the university, within schools, right? And we limit them to the students. We limit them to this kind of old model of one professor and however, 15, 20 students in a room reading, writing poems, right? And critiquing them. But what would that workshop look like if it included students and it maybe included an administrator and included cafeteria workers and included the person who checks your ID at the front gate and it included the people who clean the rooms between it, what stories would they have to tell? What poems would they have to write about this community of the institution, right? And what if we, what would we learn in a creative writing workshop, right? A social workshop like I'm talking about in which that entire community was active and present, right? What would we learn from the cafeteria workers, from the uh, security workers, from the cleaning workers, that we're not considering when we're talking about poems, right? I think there's a space to create a different way of thinking about the workshop within the institution that allows it to be a space to 
have a have a real conversation about it, right? And re, I think there's a lot of forces that don't want that kind of conversation to happen. Uh, but I'm really inspired by Ferry's notion of of what a school community is, and I I'm really interested in trying to see if that's if that's possible in this post COVID era. Um, a question from Godfrey: How can we help workers embrace writing workshops as spaces for them? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things I think that's really um, that's really helped us is it, we've never been a mandated workshop, right? We've never come in and, you know, the auto workers say, okay, I'll second shift workers on the roll line now need to take a poetry workshop. It's not the way it works. It's not the way it's going to happen. But, you know, to, ident to open these spaces to begin with, I think, and to make them regular is a very important thing because in and what we've discovered in the past you know 15 years of doing that is that there are people interested in, in writing in every single workplace right it doesn't matter if it's a ford factory in the us or south africa if it's migrant domestic workers in the netherlands or the uk uh you know one time i was doing a workshop in uh panama with one of the unions uh and the person who uh had coordinated it and was uh, doing a lot of translation at it, picked us up at the hotel, uh, she was in a taxi, and we were driving to the workshop and the taxi driver uh, asked what we were doing and, and Mar told them about it, you know, we're doing this workshop and Mark works with domestic workers and taxi drivers and and he was interested and he was like, well, I just wanted to like write about the history of my hometown, which was outside of, of uh, Panama City. Uh, you know, I think about 45 minutes north. And he was like, hmm, what do the taxi drivers do? Why do they write about blah, blah, blah. Before you know it, by the time we arrived at the trade union hall, he parked his taxi, came into the workshop and spent two hours with us writing poems about his hometown, right? And so like she, it was amazing. I mean, she should be a lead organizer somewhere, but she was able in the taxi ride from the hotel to the union office to, by just talking about what the workshop is, convince the taxi driver to like leave his taxi during like, I, it was like five, five o'clock in the evening, right after the work ended, like probably his busiest shift to leave his taxi at the, in the parking lot of the trade union office and come in and join the other workers for a workshop, right? So I think that by creating a, a space that meets regularly and meets continually, and then just by you know, the Ford workshop, we got members uh, to participate in it simply by putting an ad in the auto worker, the trade union, the locals newspaper uh, and newsletter. And and workers showed up from that. Some of the some of the organizers knew of other people who are like, you know, you're a really great storyteller. You should write some of those things down. And and here's this workshop that's happening and you could come to it. Other workers will be there. And we just, you know, sit around and uh, have a little snack and a cup of coffee, and we write down what we've been thinking about, what's been happening in our work lives and our home lives. And, you know, at the end of the year, we have an event, and you can even read at that event. The events for us have been super important uh, because it's been an opportunity for, for workers to kind of perform in front of their friends and particularly their family members. And so to have a worker, like, do a workshop for several months or longer. And then in the spring for us, you know, to be able to go to some venue and go up on stage and read their poems and have their children and their sisters and brothers see them do that, right? Our workers are always saying to me like, you know, I love my job and it's helped me, you know, pay my for my house and put my kids through school. But for them to see me outside of that role on a stage at this, you know, uh, literary festival, reading a poem was just, I can't tell you what it meant to me to have that opportunity for them to see me in a different light and in a different way, right? Not that I'm not proud of my job, but here I was on stage as a performer. Like, who doesn't want to be on stage as a performer? Who doesn't want a crowd of a hundred people clapping for you when you're telling a story about your life, right? Or performing a story about your life with other workers. And so, uh, so I think that wherever we are, workers want to tell their stories and, but there aren't spaces available for them to 
kind of hone that practice and to practice their craft and to be encouraged to write them down and perform them. And so simply by opening a workshop like this, publicizing it and keeping it going, because people, you know, we'll have people like, oh, I'm coming and then they're not there that month. Oh, I'm coming and then they're not there that month. But three, four months later, suddenly they do show up one Saturday and they write and they meet others and they enjoy it. And then, you know, like Christine Lewis, one of our members from Domestic Workers United, she's been coming for 10 years to Poetry Workshop. Uh, so I think that opening that space is the first step and keeping it open is the, is the important second step. I imagine so that, that's also quite important to a lot of the, the people that you work with that have quite precarious um, jobs where they don't have much control over when they work. Right. And so it's difficult, it'd be difficult for them to, to come potentially yeah. come every month or every week or. Right. Yeah. But I, I think people then, if you know it's going to happen every Saturday afternoon, the first Saturday of the month, you can kind of plan for that. Right? You don't have to take off every week, right? It's not meeting so much that it becomes a, a, you know, too difficult to do with your work schedule and your family schedule. Like we have found that once a month meeting together to be, really just like a, a place for us to all come together, to touch base, to share what's going on in our lives, and then to write it down, right? I often say, and, and the members of the Worker Writer School will laugh, but people come in and they tell the best stories. And then I always, about 15 minutes in before we really start, I say, well, it's too bad we're not called the Worker Talkers School, because we're all experts at talking, but we're called the Worker Writers School. So everything we've been talking about, let's try to get it down on paper. How do we write it? How do we put it down? How do we edit it, shape it? craft it right we'll read it out loud and people say i love that first line you know or i love that image in your poem or i wasn't sure about the ending and then people have to take it home with them and work on it and revise it right but creating that and knowing you can come back a month later and do it all over again is is i think one of the things that uh has drawn people in and encourages them to come back and i'll just say one thing because you know we're all doing this on zoom now is that when we went on zoom uh in april we discovered that we, we, we needed that connection, like we had been missing that connection in our lives, both because we're used to the regular monthly meeting and we've all been social distancing, so some way for us to get back together and connect. So we actually started in April meeting twice a month on Zoom. And we've even now had uh, one of our members, Hazel, uh, who had gone back to Trinidad to take care of her mother uh, about two years ago, maybe, uh, is now back in our workshop. Because of this format, she can join us from Trinidad. Another worker has moved uh, to her uh, friend's family's home in another state, and she's able to join us on the workshop on Zoom. So I actually have been able to kind of open up at the workshop a little more through use of this format. Uh, and there's a comment from Evelyn. There's also tremendous value in listening in such spaces. We often talk about activist poetics extracted from the sites of organizing from which they emerged. So I'm really excited to read more about the space of organizing and the poetics in the book, um, which she she will certainly read quite a, a lot about. Um, I think we're close to time. If there's another question or something that perhaps we missed that you'd like to talk about, Mark? Well, no, I, I just want to say that, you know, people often say, well, can we start a worker writer school workshop? And it's, I, I don't, I'm not at all interested in having a brand. I'm just trying to put out a kind of a model for institutions to attempt to try and, uh, and do themselves. And so again, to us, the most important things are always that connection to the trade union movement and the worker center for mem participants in the workshop. We feel like it's super important to always have uh, an organizer, uh, uh, someone from the union who's there to be able to help if need be, um, to create, to just open a space for, for workers who do have stories to write down and tell, to, to, to open your doors and to keep them open on a kind of regular basis. Like that to us has been some of the most important lessons that we know that every first Saturday of the month, including this upcoming first Saturday in October, that we are from 1.30 to 3 o'clock or 3.30 in the afternoon going to be there all together on the screen now, some point in the future, back together in person around that table, telling our stories 
editing them, sharing them, performing them. That's what we're here for. And so I encourage any other, uh, you know, writers, trade unionists out there to give this an opportunity because it's been completely enlightening for us and, and something that the workers have always wanted to come back for. You know, we have, as I said, people who have been coming eight, nine, 10 years to Poetry Workshop uh, and have become incredible poets, incredible performers, and have made lifelong friends with, with their fellow workers in other fields. So uh, I, am, I am hopeful that people will start those. If they have questions, they should contact us. The best way is probably through our Instagram page, Worker Writer School. Uh, I'm happy to talk more. Other members of our, uh, of our school uh, are happy to talk about how it's worked for domestic workers or taxi drivers or other workers. So uh, we are here if people want to try to get something like this started. Uh, and I just, again, want to thank uh, the magazine and the United Workers Union for, for hosting us. It's been great to uh, have this conversation with you and with everybody out there. So thank you. It's been fantastic. And it is a tremendous, tremendous book. I would encourage everyone to, to read it. Um, thank you so much. Thank you much. so much. That was wonderful. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Mark. I think I'm definitely going to have to go to coffeehousepress.org and order the book. And, you know, we've got a great space with the oldest workers' parliament in the world at Victorian Trades Hall, and I think there's a real opportunity uh, in our neck of the woods to have a really great workers' writers' school as, as an ongoing practice and a way to build collectivity. Well, that's excellent. And if um, you need me at any point to talk about it or to, you know, lead a workshop or just to brainstorm with, by all means, do get in touch with me. I'm happy to talk about it. Thank you. That's Very absolutely that, And thank you all for putting this together and hosting. Uh, it was fabulous to talk about the book. And thank you, Benjamin. Those are superb questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for watching and for tuning in. And also thank you for leaving comments and asking questions. Um, as the banners were um, playing throughout this conversation, uh, you can get a copy of Mark's book from Coffee House Press. Uh, you can buy it online. Um, I, if we can ever access bookshops in person ever again, yeah, we'll definitely I'm sure that. we'll be able to do that as well. Um, but we have popped the Instagram for Workers Writers School uh, on the screen now if you would like to go and Please find look it up. It looks like an excellent project. some more information. And you're also free to at any point in time visit the websites for Overland Literary Journal and for the United Workers Union to find more out more about the different projects um, that uh, we're both working on. Uh, so, uh, Godfrey, did you want to add anything there? Uh, well, I would just like to say that, um, you know, we have had a very tough year with COVID-19 and everything else that's been going on in the world, but um, at the Union we're still very much committed to the Fair Australia Prize and we're hoping we can uh, make some announcements soon. Absolutely. Um, that was wonderful. I think that was a great uh, reminder of the importance of solidarity um, for all of us, I think. Thank you so much, Benjamin and Mark, and thank you again to all of our viewers.